welcome to Nash Lakes Royston. You join me in session on Wood Lake. I've got 24 hours ahead of me to try and catch as many carp as I possibly can. Wood Lake is about three or five acres in size, but the main feature here is the depth. It gets very deep and it gets very deep very quickly. It's down to about 30 foot in some places. Because of that depth, it means that zigs are gonna be the call of action for the day. I've done very well here this past spring and summer um, on zigs, and I'm hoping to replicate that again this year. I've had a few sessions down here already this year. They've not quite been as successful as last year, but I think it's because we've not had the prolonged period of warm weather weather, where the deep water's warmed up and the carp are truly on the move. So hopefully today's that day. I put the deeper out already to try and find the depth that they're at. Not really found too much, so I've put zigs out at depths I know that um, I know that they like to be at. So I'm between sort of 12 and 18 foot. Hopefully I'm at the right depth there. Once I do get that first bite and I know what depth they're gonna be at, then all rods will move over to that depth and I'll try and maximize on the action. I'm sure that the fish here operate as sort of shoal fish, they move around in big groups. You wanna be at that correct depth when that big shoal of fish move in front of you and you can really have it off. You can have a hit of sort of two or three fish at once if you've got that all right. As I said, don't really know the depth they're at yet, so we're gonna chop and change until we find that depth and then hopefully we will catch a few. Well, it's been a very bleak day, not seen much at all. I've been chucking the deeper out, trying to find them, um, trying to exit different depths, even try to single out in the middle, because I think I saw a couple on the, uh, on the deeper right holding bottom. Finally, in amongst the waves, we've seen a show, uh, an area I've not really fished too much today. So I'm gonna try and get three zigs as close as I can to that area at different depths, at 12 foot, 14 foot, and 17 foot. So I'm hoping that if it's moving through those upper layers, I've got at least one zig in that area. Hopefully we'll have seen one, there's more than one, there's a group moving through. And um, yeah, let's get them out there. And fingers crossed, it does us a bite. As I said, we saw that one show Put the put the uh, zigs towards him, and the 12 foot has just gone. Now the issue with Royston is that there can be quite a few snags. So the first sort of 20 seconds of a fight are often a little bit hairy. So I'm just going to focus on this for a while before I uh, get too excited that we've got a fish, just to make sure that we've got him away from those snags. I think we should be all right. This is why I like to fish with sort of a size seven floater claw here, because one, you've got the barbless rule, and two, you do need to bully them to start with. Like those first 10, 20 seconds are, you need to give them some, to pull them out of that water and get them away from the snag. Another reason why I won't use the adjustables is, because I need to, you need to be able to pull them up, whereas if you've got the adjustable, you've got a lot of a lot of clutter banging around that could catch on the snag. So I think we're doing all right and we've got him away. So yesterday when I got down here, it was um, shorts and t-shirt weather. Now, snow is just starting to fall lightly. So good old English weather. It is proper coming down, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Two right we can. Got away with one here, the lead's not dropped and I've still managed to pull it away, which isn't ideal, but the carp gods are looking down on me and it's not gotten in the snags, thankfully. Yeah, I think that shows how much I was rushing to get that rod back out, but... Oh, hello. That I put the, um, the leg clip on a little bit too, too firmly. Ooh. Whew. 
tell you what, that one feels very, very good. And it looks like an all right one. Get in there. Right, so I managed to unhook her in the net. She's still down there in the net. We're gonna get that rod straight back out. As I said, I think they are shellfish in here. They move around in a pack. So once you've got that one bite, get the rod back out. This one was 12 foot, straight back out there. The other two are in the area, but different depths. So we're gonna cut them down to 12 foot as well and get them all in that area. And hopefully we can nick one more very quickly. Things were looking quite bleak. The weather was not great for zig fishing. Loads of waves, hard to spot fish. I did spot one. We got zigs towards it and the 12 footer was the one that went. And this cool little scaly half lin mid 20 was the culprit. Nash zig screw, topped with maggots. Happy, happy days. Pressure is now off that I've had that one. I can sit back and enjoy the session a little bit more. Weather-wise, we've had it all this session. I think Joe could cut it to make it look like we've been fishing for four different seasons if he wanted to. We've just had a big snow shower now, the sun's out, and because the sun's out, although I've caught that fish on a 12-foot zig, I'm gonna to decide to put a couple of, uh, of rods on 18-foot zigs. So I think that with the sun out, the fish could be moving up a little bit in the water. Before I get these rigs back out, I thought I'd quickly run through what I use and why I use it. For hook bait, I go for sort of a mixture of different things, really. For the kicker, I use the Nash Zig screws and I go for a yellow one for, for the most part. I do tend to use red as well, but I like to use a coloured one here just to yeah, have a little bit of uh, extra traction to try and grab the carp's attention. For the actual piece of hook bait, I'll go for a piece of black foam. I'll go for a 7mm piece. A lot of people like to use the 5mm one, but for me, when you're zig fishing, you lure fishing for them. You're trying to get that reaction out of them, so I like to use a big bold uh, bait to try and really grab their attention. I think that the black's perfect because it silhouettes perfectly. So if you've got a carp swimming underneath it and it's sort of looking up, scanning the area, it will really stand out this big bit of black foam as opposed to maybe a slim bit of uh, red or yellow foam. I also love tipping my zigs with maggots. For me, when I first started zig fishing, I just couldn't get my head around the fact that a fish would just eat this bit of flavorless foam. Like it just, it just didn't compute with me. I, I get it now, but I still like to add a little bit more traction with with a ball of maggots. I think a carp swimming past sees that wiggling ball of maggots, and I mean, anyone will tell you, it's, it's Alan Blair's favorite uh, hook bait choice, a big ball of maggots, what carp can resist. Um, hook wise, I go a little bit unorthodox here. I know people like to use like a size 12 or a size 10 floater claw, and I think that this is what gives zigs the bad rep of losing a lot of fish. I don't think zigs are responsible for losing a lot of fish. I think it's the components people use with zigs that are responsible for using a lot of, uh, losing a lot of fish. So I like to go for a size seven floater claw. I like to use this bigger, bigger hook because I just think that once they're hooked that way, they've got much less chance of losing them as you do with a size 12 hook, for instance. The float claws are the perfect um, pattern for zig fishing. They're thin diameter, so they're not gonna be, um, they're not gonna weigh the, the foam down. And also with that overturned point and the angled bends in the, um, in the actual hook, and it's so hard for the hook to be ejected once the carp sucks it in and is then hooked. Hook link material, uh, 10 pound zig float all the way through, and I'm fishing these um, fixed. The reason I'm fishing these fixed are, one, because of the number of snags in here. I think with the number of snags, as I said when I was playing that fish, you really need to bully them those first 20 seconds to pull them out the water and get them away from the snags at the bottom. Once you've done that, it's plain sailing. However, if you've got an adjustable zig, even though it would make much more sense with the depth here, and obviously I'm changing depths all the time to try and find where they're at, I think if you've got an adjustable, you've got a lead that you can't eject, you've got a, um, a big float just swinging around all the place, you've got much more chance of that being drawn into a snag and you losing that fish. So it can be quite difficult sometimes, the casting can be a pain, netting them can be a bit of a stretch at times, especially when you're using sort of 18 foot fixed zigs. But um, I just think that you've got much more chance of landing more fish with a fixed zig, especially at this venue, than you do with adjustables. Now onto the lead arrangement. Now first off, I use an XL tungsten anti-tangle sleeve. The reason I use a tungsten one here is actually quite important. My thinking behind this, and I'd love to say I thought this myself, but I'm pretty sure I overheard it from either Alfie, Tom, or Alan talking about it in the office, so I'd love to take credit for it, but it's, it's not my own idea. But the reason I use an XL tungsten one is, you've got to imagine that when that's sitting on the lake bed, with this being weighted tungsten, it's going to act like a hinge mechanism. 
If you're just fishing with a clear one straight through, that's going to fit, sit straight up like this. So if a carp's coming along, the hook's sat like that and it goes to suck it in, it won't go, it won't put its mouth all the way in, it sucks and it needs that movement to allow the hook to come back and get a good hook hold. If you've got a tungsten one, you've got that hinge mechanism which allows that hook to move back into its mouth and properly hook the carp. However, if you've got a clear one, it's going to sit straight up and you're not going to get that movement that's going to allow the hook to really get back and really hook the carp. So I think it's quite important to use an XL tungsten anti-tangle sleeve as opposed to a clear one just because if you get that hinge mechanism and you get much better hook holds in my opinion. I also like to use a tiny little bit of rig tubing um, just to sort of have a stiff section here which helps with, um, helps with anti-tangle properties. I think that people are very worried, especially when you're sort of going over seven, eight, nine foot in zig, um, zig hook lengths that you're gonna get tangles. I really never ever have tangles. With the XL um, anti-tangle sleeve and with this little bit of rig tubing, I never ever get uh, tangles and I'm casting out 20 foot zig um, hook links at times and like I say, never ever get tangles. I'm gonna show you a few things now before I cast out that I do to make sure I don't get tangles. I'm sure if you follow them yourself, you will never ever have any issues with your hook link tangling around your main line. So first of all, the most important thing is obviously to make sure you've got a nice clear area. You've got a long hook link here. You don't want to be catching on your bivy or any overhanging trees or anything like that. So thankfully we've got this in this swim here. Second of all, I put my hook on a lid of a maggot pot. I can use a bucket lid or anything like that just to make sure it's not catching on any debris when I'm casting because obviously with it being such a long hook link, it will be on the floor. So you need to make sure that you're in a nice clear area where it's not going to catch because the last thing you want is to cast out, catch a bit of bark as it's going and you're not fishing effectively uh, after that. For the cast, it's pretty much the same as how I'd cast a bottom bait rig. The only thing I normally do is I try and release a little bit earlier than I would with a bottom bait rig. This is just because I don't want that hook, um, that hook coming in quite quickly. So if you're releasing with a bit more of an arc, you sort of exaggerate that cast a little bit more. It sort of follows in a lot nicer and you've got absolutely no chance of tangling then. I also make sure that I feather the cast just before it hits the surface, as you would with any cast. And I look for that separation between the lead and the hook bait. You can see it, unless you're whacking it sort of 110, 120 yards, which I'm not in this case, and I very, very rarely, in fact, I never ever cast zigs that far, because I can't. Um, I just watch for that separation, which you can see with the naked eye quite easily, especially when you've got a big hook bait like I am with the seven mil foam and the ball of maggots. You can see it all quite clearly. Just watch that separation. If you've got that separation, you know that you're fishing fine and it's as simple as that really. I think a lot of people are very wary and daunted by the prospect of casting any zig, but let alone zigs that are sort of 10 foot plus in length. Once you've done it a few times, it is really very simple and before you know it, you'll be casting 18, 19, 20 foot thick zigs like it's nothing. There we go, simple as that. Another thing to consider when you're zig fishing and probably one of the most important things is your bite indication. Now, you've got to think that you've got an 18 foot hook link there so a carp can come in, get hooked, shake its head, swim around a bit. I mean, it's got 18 foot of movement there before it even needs to move your lead and you're going to get a, a, a beep on the, uh, on the alarm. So because of that, you need to fish as tight lines as you possibly can, really, really tight so that any slight movement is going to get picked up. And then you've got to think that if you get any beep whatsoever, to really watch your rod tip. I, if I get any beep, I'm watching my rod tip and seeing if there's any movement there. If there is, I'm gonna put it down as a bite and not a line. And the amount of times I've had a, had a bite where I've had a single beep, I've gone out, I've watched the rod tip, it's just knocking slightly, I've lifted into it and there's a fish on the end. So just bear that in mind when you're zig fishing. There's no way you can fish with sort of slack lines or anything like that. You need it to be as straight as possible. And another thing is, it doesn't matter that you're fishing with really straight lines, especially when you're fishing with an 18 foot zig that straight line isn't going to, down to your lead, isn't going to spook any carp because the carp that you're targeting aren't going to be feeding anywhere down near your lead. They're going to be feeding 18 foot above you. So it's, it's something that you have to do, but you don't, get the, um, you don't get the disadvantages of doing it as you would with a, um, with a bottom bait rig because you're not going to be spooking any carp with that, with that straight line running to your lead and that feeding area because the feeding area is above the lead. So I'm going to get that into position, make sure it's as tight as I can get it. There we go. As you can see there, really tight. I'll get a single bleep as they move away from the um, move away from the rod, and then I normally get back drops. Probably the most common bite I get on a zig is a back drop, especially when I'm fishing at this sort of length. But make sure you've got as tight as you possibly can, and then your bite indication won't be an issue. <laughs> Well, we're getting to 
the end of the day now. We've had more snow today, more bright sunshine, more windy weather, and it's gonna get down to about minus two tonight. So I decided to bring all the zigs down to 12 foot, put them just out in the middle. I'm not feeling too hopeful. I've never done too well on zigs um, here in the night, but I'm, I'm hoping that first light, that little bit of warmth as the, um, after a cold night brings them up and hopefully there's a chance at first light. Um, the one fish I've had today was, yeah, based, just based on seeing a show. Hopefully we'll see a few more shows tomorrow and we can nab one more, but yeah, it's not been the best weather for it. I'm gonna get these out now, get down, get up at first light and uh, let's see if we can nick one more before Joe needs to leave me. <music> It was a freezing cold night last night. Nothing to report from me. I spoke to a few of the anglers. I don't think anyone else has caught either. I've seen very little shows. I heard one show about 4 a.m. this morning, right out in the middle. Other than that, yeah, I've not seen anything to go for. Although I had that fish yesterday at, tw at 12 foot, because of this change in weather, I don't think they're staying at 12 foot. They could be anywhere in those mid to upper layers. So my plan is I'm gonna reel all three rods in and fish three rods between 12 and 18 foot out in the middle where I know they like to sort of shoal up historically on this lake. If I see anything show, I'll position all rods into that area and I know then that I've got all those different layers covered. So should they be at 12, 15 or 18 foot, I've got a zig there that hopefully hooks them. I'm gonna get those rods out now and then I'm gonna show you how I actually tied my zigs. out of that horrible wind, gotten somewhere warm in the blockhouse. I'm gonna talk you through how I tie my zigs up. Now, first up, we need a hook link material. I always go for the zig. So the reason I use zig flow as my, um, as my hook link and not just a standard mono mainline is very important. So zig flow is very, very low diameter. It's clear, so it goes almost invisible in water. Despite the fact that it is low diameter, it's got great abrasion resistance. And um, yeah, so it means that even if you're fishing up against snags, you've got every chance of landing those fish if they do start to grate up against there. The floating element is very important as well. It means that you're not gonna weigh that zig down, that it's gonna act as naturally as possible up in those upper layers. And for me, this is the perfect floating hook link. I use it for my uh, floater fishing as well. And I wouldn't use anything other than zig float for my, um, for my zig presentations. So we need to select our desired length. Um, as I said, I fished from anywhere between to this session 10 and 18 foot, but I'm not going to tie an 18 foot one. I'm going to tie just a six foot one just to demonstrate it and make it a little bit simpler. I know a lot of people are very anal about getting that length dead on. Uh, Alfie Willingale, I'm looking at you. However, I'm not so bothered as long as I'm within sort of half a foot, I'm quite happy. So when I measure it, I know that my wingspan's about six foot. So I do them in six, month, six foot increments. So for me, there we go, that's six foot. So I'll cut it there. And this is the hook link section. So we've got six foot there of zig flow. Next step is to slide on one of the zig screws. As I said, I like to go for a colored one as the, uh, as the actual zig screw and then go for black as the zig foam. I've got a yellow one here. So very simply just slide this on. like so. The good thing about these um, zig screws is not only that you can easily attach your hook bait, but also it acts as sort of like a kicker so that you're not gonna close the gape of the hook because this is quite a stiff uh, material. The zig flow is quite stiff. So if you don't have this, it can close that gape and you don't get that um, aggressive uh, hook presentation that you want. Next up is the hook pattern I use. I always go for floater claws. For me, the aggression of the actual hook pattern and the fact that it's quite a thin diameter, means it is perfect for zig fishing. However, unlike what a lot of people like to do and go for size 12s or 10s, I like a big one. Like I said earlier, zigs aren't renowned for their hooking and uh, hook to land ratio. And for me, that's not down to the actual rig so much. It's more down to the fact that people like to, like to use really dainty, um, like 
setups and so therefore I go for a size seven. Especially in this lake, you've got to bully the fish to start with to pull them away from those snags. And if I've got a size 12, I'm not going to be able to put as much pressure on that fish as I'd like. So that's why I like to go for a size seven, quite a big hook size for zig fishing traditionally. But for me, it works perfectly. So I attach this with a very simple seven turn blood knot. Any knot that you use to attach um, hook to line will do absolutely fine. This is just what I favour. The most important thing is to make sure that you moisten the knot before, before closing it because it's so low diameter zig flow. Um, you can get line burn if you don't do this, so make sure you're wetting that knot before you pull it tight. There we go. I just trim off the tag end. Again, I will moisten the hook shank just to help slide on that zig screw a little bit better. Because it is quite a uh, bigger hook pattern than normal, it can take a little bit of pushing to get it on as opposed to what it would with a size 10 or a 12. But then we have it on like so. Then I'll get my actual hook bait, which as I said yesterday is seven mil zig foam. I use seven mil because as I said, for me, you're, you're trying to get that reaction out of a fish. You're trying to get that lure-like aggressive take from them. And the bigger for me, the better. So I'll cut off quite a good amount. I know a lot of people, like I said, like to use the thin and go for really small, but you're trying to get that, that reaction out of the carp. And I think therefore that a nice big bit is important. So something like that is ideal. It's a very simple case then of just screwing this on. These zig screws are excellent because you can change your hook bait colour very easily. Maybe you've got, you find out that uh, red or yellow or a different colour like that is doing well. You can quickly change over and also let's say you have a fish uh, at some point and it burrs the hook over. You don't have to tie a whole new um, zig um, hook link section up. To tie, the, to tie the hair on again, you can just simply pull the zig screw back, snip off a tiny little bit, tie the hook on again, and you're good to go. So most people would be fishing their zigs like that. However, like I said, I love to top mine with maggots. I think that that is the biggest edge you can get. So you've got a nice ball of maggots on the top. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna attach the maggots. So I use a boiling needle for this. You can use any maggot needle. We do a maggot needle as well at Nash, which is, um, which is a white handle, I believe. But I do just use a standard boiling needle and I'll take a bunch of maggots. Anywhere between sort of seven to 10, I think is a good number. Any more than that and you're starting to risk weighing the zig down a little bit. Um, any less than that, I don't think you get the movement you want. So I think 10 is a, an ideal number to aim for, but yeah, whatever works best for you. Try it yourself, see which one you get um, the most reaction from, from the carp, and then go for that as your standard sort of approach. So all I'm doing is I'm piercing them, piercing them at the top through the two little black eyes to avoid bursting them. Making like a nice little maggoty kebab on the, um, on the, bait, script, on the bait needle. There we go. So I've got about eight on there at the moment wiggling away. And then what I do is I actually use zig flow again as um, instead of using bait floss, I use zig flow. Take a small bit of zig flow. You don't need to take six foot this time, just a small little bit. A few inches, six, seven inches like that. Sweet. And then I'll just double it over at one end and push all the maggots on like so. Got the maggots on there. Then I will, this, is, this bit is important here. First, I'll secure them in place. This avoids the maggots wiggling around and untying the knot once it's out in the water. So I'll do a, like a three turn granny knot, I think this is. Just a very simple knot. Do two of them just to secure it in place. I now know that those maggots aren't gonna go anywhere. They're not gonna untie that knot whilst it's out in the water and leave me maggotless they're secured in place and now they're ready to actually attach to the zig foam. I attach them to the zig foam, so I pierce through the top of the zig, uh, the zig foam, all the way through, like so. Same thing again, I sort of double over, so I've got a little loop and pull it through. 
and then it's exactly the same process as before with two three-turn granny nuts to secure it in place. Trim the tag ends of this. And there we go. That is the business end of my zig, ready to be cast out, ready to entice any passing carp into sucking that in and hopefully getting a bite. Now it's a very simple case of putting on the XL anti-tangle sleeve. Again, as I said yesterday, make sure you use tungsten just to get that hinge mechanism. It definitely, definitely increases hook holds. It allows the zig to be taken further back by the carp, especially if they're not sucking the hook bait in. They're, they're not going right up to the hook bait when they're sucking it. They're sucking it from a little bit of a distance. This is important to have. And there we have it. So that is six foot long, and it's a case of attaching that to your lead clip presentation with a small bit of rig tubing just up um, from the lead to create that stiff boom to reduce tangles. And yeah, it is ready to be cast out almost anywhere. The best thing about zigs is you can cast it wherever you see a show. You don't have to find a, an amazing clear spot. You can fish it in amongst weed, providing the zig is longer than the actual weed. And for me, they are still, despite everyone going on about how good they are, still a massively underused presentation that will definitely, especially at this time of year, catch you more fish. No further action this morning, despite we casting those zigs at different depths. We've been looking for shows. If we saw a show, we'd get those zigs out towards them like we did yesterday, which did result in a fish. However, it's been very hard to spot one with the, with the waves and everything, despite keeping our eyes on the water. We have had one fish. It's not been prolific like it can be here on the zigs. I have had some mental sessions here in the past where you can't keep a rod in the water, but today's not been the day, I think. It's a little bit too early. This is, a, like I said, this is a deep lake. It takes a while for it to warm up, for the fish to move around. I think despite having a few warm days previously, this little cold snap maybe forced them to shoal up again and they're not quite as active as we'd hope for a, for a big hit session. However, we have had that nice one, so it's not been the end of the world. I'm gonna go for a very slow pack down now. I'm gonna keep the rods in for another hour whilst I pack away. So you might see me again with one last gasp fish. I really do think that if I hadn't been using zigs, if I'd just been fishing on the bottom, I wouldn't have had a bite at all. There's quite a few people fishing here today and no one else has had a bite since I've been here and I'm pretty sure that they're all fishing on the bottom. I do think that those fish are shoulder up together somewhere in mid-water. They're just not being very active. And when they're not showing, it's so hard to locate where they are. Even with the deeper and everything, I just can't really find that exact area that they're at and get a zig on them and be at the correct depth. It is a bit of a minefield, so that one fish that I did manage to, ca to catch was, uh, yeah, was a bit of a result, I think. I'm going to leave these rods out whilst I uh, pack away, so I might catch one more, but if not, I'm going to pack away, get somewhere warm, get out of this wind, and then hopefully next time I'm down here, I will have a much more productive session than I have had this time. Mm -hmm.